Jolly good. I hope everybody can see that just sort of initial title page. I have become fascinated by the role of women in the Great War. And so tonight, I'd like to shed a little bit of light on a very murky part of women's wartime service. The spies who operated deep inside enemy lines. To begin with, on the 15th of October 1917, a woman met her death by firing squad at the Chateau de Vincennes in Paris. Her execution was greeted with jubilation in France, which by this third year of the war was beset by strikes and was still facing one of the most bitter mutinies of all times. To put it in a nutshell, French morale was at an all-time low. This woman was, of course, Marta Hari. The British popular press jumped onto the opprobrium bandwagon and, true to form, whipped up a frenzy against her on this side of the channel. Despite some reports praising her courage in refusing the proffered blindfold, she soon came to represent the vamp, the femme fatale, the other, everything that was to be feared of women in wartime. A reputation that has actually stuck, although there is almost no evidence that she ever did any spying at all, as even the French prosecutor at her trial admitted some 20 years after the fatal verdict was reached, there was actually not enough evidence to hang a cat. The euphoria that greeted Marta Hari's demise was the exact opposite of what occurred following the so-called martyrdom of Edith Cavell. Whatever the early controversies surrounding her death, the benefit of distance from the events which took place as dawn broke on October the 12th, 1915 at the Tier National in, in Brussels has led to the acceptance by historians that the action was legitimate, even if it was a propaganda disaster of monumental proportion. By helping Allied soldiers to escape, Edith Cavell had broken both the spirit and the letter of the Geneva Convention that stipulates that all medical personnel are neutral and can offer only medical aid to combatants. She herself recognized the legitimacy of the sentence and was resigned to her fate. But although the, pop the British popular press both then have now and now have generally focused exclusively on Marta Hari and Edith Cavell. They were not the only women imprisoned and sentenced to death during the First World War. And recently released records show that a due process of law was followed by both sides. The French executed a total of nine female agents, and we shall in due course this evening follow one of their court's deliberations. After the Cavell de debacle, the Germans were more cautious in terms of executing women, but did not totally refrain. So this webinar, like the listeners, has an international flavor as I introduce you to several women who, whatever we might feel about their actions or indeed the driving force behind these, showed extraordinary courage and were truly the foremothers of the better known, much lauded spies of World War II. But first of all, let's think not about the spies themselves, but about the most important figure of all in this intricate game where the rewards are high and the penalty is death. The person who recruited them, trained them, paid them, and was what we might call the master puppeteer pulling the strings of those who operated deep inside enemy territory. So let us shine our first spotlight on a woman who operated in the shadows, Dr. Elizabeth Schragmuller, a truly exceptional woman, even by today's standards, even more so by those of a century ago. Her story begins at the turn of the 20th century when, despite her own father and indeed the widespread German prohibition on women entering higher education, 
In 1908, Elisabeth forced the Albert Ludwig Universität in Fribourg in Breisgau to enroll her as a student. She proved so brilliant that having been awarded the highest bachelor's degree of her year, she was actually allowed to continue her studies, becoming in 1913, the first German woman to earn a doctorate in political economy, and she earned it with distinction. This was not exactly what her wealthy family expected of their eldest daughter. Her outstanding brains were almost an inconvenience in a female child. Styling herself Fräulein Doktor, her job as a social worker brought her into contact with members of the working class. She would soon put her increased knowledge and understanding of human psychology to excellent use in the service of her beloved fatherland. When war broke out, Elizabeth was furious that as a woman, she could not serve in the German army. She was determined to do her bit. And by the 20th of August, 1914, she was in German occupied Brussels, where she began waylaying the notoriously vicious, newly appointed governor of Brussels, Field Marshal Colmar von der Galtz, demanding a job. Finally, fed up, he capitulated and he shunted her off to a backwater, a military office, handling mail confiscated from Belgian soldiers. Here, her ability to pick out every vital nugget of information, place this in the bigger picture and provide military commanders with an accurate overview of troop morale and movements, probably hastened Antwerp's fall to the Germans in October 1914. Walter Nicolai, head of the German Intelligence Bureau, sat up and took note. He sent her to be trained in military intelligence and following that training to the male staff's fury, she was placed in charge of the anti-French intelligence bureau, including recruitment and training of agents to be deployed across all of the Western theater, a huge role. Elizabeth soon realized that in the real world of intelligence gathering, to be successful, both recruiter and spy have to form part of a highly structured, well-organized whole. No detail should be overlooked and the better trained the agent, the more reliable their information. The challenge of recruiting, training and debriefing spies was to her a mind game, which she played to the very best of her superb intellectual ab abilities. Espionage was a science which could be taught and learnt, not some sort of adventure to be undertaken for cheap thrills and a quick buck. Almost certainly thanks to her brief career in social work, she realised that a good spy can be found in unlikely places. Rather than look for intellectuals, she was far from averse to using even those who were barely educated. An illiterate florist and a music hall artiste in Marseille proved amongst her most effective agents, responsible for sinking thousands of tons of allied shipping and almost certainly contributing to France's defeat on the Chemin des Dames. She could be utterly ruthless, quickly deselecting individuals whose aptitudes did not match her exacting standards or who did not demonstrate the expected level of commitment. She had a pitiless approach to sacrificing a lesser spy to protect a more valuable one. And to return briefly to Mata Hari, it is very probable that it was Schragmuller who hung her out to dry. Of course, it was not only Germany who was on the lookout for potential spies. And so let's stay in occupied Belgium where in August 1914, a 22-year-old Belgian medical student, Marta Knockart, found herself swept up in the German army's ruthless advance through her, her homeland. Due to her medical training, she was conscripted as a nurse in the German military hospital near the German front line at Dixmude. 
initially outraged at being forced to work for the enemy, to her consternation, she found her loyalties dividing. As a patriot, she loathed Germany for invading her, her homeland. As a humanitarian, she empathized with the sufferings of her German patients. And as a human being, she realized that not all soldiers were evil. I think her feelings towards soldiers help us to understand the actions of those who post both world wars were branded as collaboratrice. Continuing to hate a person with whom one has daily interactions can be hard. These Belgian and French women's experiences were in contrast to those of the majority of British women who had no contact with German individuals and saw the Hun as uniformly evil. Nevertheless, she began taking significant risks, facilitating the escape of allied soldiers who had been brought into the hospital as prisoner patients. She knew that if caught, if caught she too would face the death penalty. Soon, she was noticed by those who had set up a network, a spy network in occupied Belgium. Her initial reaction to being recruited as a spy was filled with horror. Although, she writes, I knew that spies existed, I regarded them as things inhuman and far removed from my own sphere. Her mother, who would live to regret her defiant words, was more enthusiastic. I give her willingly and proudly, just as I have given my sons. Martha's acquiescence occurred after considerable soul searching, mental anguish and fear for her life, and of course, reliving in her mind the Cavell story. Everyone was suspected by the Germans of being a spy. Spy mania was soon fanned into a flame. If even the innocent was suspect and not infrequently shot out of hand, what fate would befall a woman who had willingly assumed the role? I think it is important to acknowledge the fear which many spies confess to having felt. After all, to be afraid is human. To overcome it is heroic. And there is much that is deeply heroic in Mart and many wartime spies' story. Mart soon discovered the humanitarian consequences of her spying activities. After the Allied bombing of nearby Roulet Station in the spring of 1915, she writes, it was I who was responsible for the hellish scene that was now being enacted. I threw myself on my bed and wept as though my heart was breaking. She describes in unflinching detail how her actions had killed friend and foe alike. I wandered along an endless street of smoking ruins where the way was strewn with mangled corpses whose glassy eyeballs watched me accusingly. Perhaps unlike soldiers who have the sense of a collective ordered action to shield behind, she recognizes her own culpability in the deaths of the unknown soldiers and also my little German officer friend of the railway transport, who had unwittingly divulged secret information, and because of her transmission to the British, now left behind two young orphaned daughters in Hanover. However many times she might tell herself, I was serving my country, there are times when this mantra was not sufficient to exonerate her in her own heart. Of course, the German authorities and the doctors at Roulet Hospital had no reason to suspect her, and so her espionage and medical work continued in parallel. In late April 1915, she was working up the line near Langemark in a field hospital, packed with French soldiers beating and fighting the air for breath, their faces contorted out of all human shape. She had acquired first-hand knowledge of what the strange-shaped cylindrical object she had seen being stockpiled at Roulet 
and had reported to the British were four, and how the Germans had no antidote to the poison they had unleashed. For her devotion to duty uh, the, uh, during the early gas attacks, she was awarded the German Iron Cross second class, one of seemingly only five German nurses to earn this decoration. Her role as a nurse at the German military hospital and her Iron Cross gave her greater freedom to move around the town than was accorded to most Belgians who were under the jurisdiction of the strict German military code. Curfews were strictly enforced, but being able to go abroad at night enabled her to undertake clandestine activities. When a colonel invited her to Brussels to see the opera, to eat decent food, she seized the opportunity, less, it might be said, to eat decent food than because her British spy masters had tasked her with finding out about the date and time of the Kaiser's proposed visit to Brussels. Aware that more would be required of her than pleasant company and that she may not be able to hold the care colonel at arm's length, she answered her own question, why had I done it? She concluded it was for the sake of ravished Belgium. In theory, at least, being ravished herself would simply mean that she was sharing her motherland's fate. However, when confronted by the colonel making clear the payment he expected for his hospitality, she successfully escaped from their hotel out of a window. Having seen in Brussels how her countrywomen were caught in a holocaust of degradation over which they had no control. She realized the stark choice confronting many Belgian women, become what is now euphemistically referred to as a comfort woman or starve. Her subsequent refusal to work as a German agent, which was proposed on her return from Brussels, made the Germans sit up and take notice of her was she perhaps not all that she made out to be? And having notice taken of you is fatal for a spy. Soon the net began closing in around her. Forgetting the warning given to her by the woman who recruited her as a spy, if you are caught, it will probably be your own fault. She fell into the trap set for her. And in November 1916, she was arrested and despite continuous interrogation, refused to say a word which would Im implicate others in her network. Resisting all forms of co coercion, she was brought to trial. The death sentence was passed. Then the chief medic of Roulet Military Hospital asked leave to speak in her defense. He reminded the court of her Iron Cross citation that she had risked her life in the field and her sentence was commuted to life imprisonment in Ghent prison. She writes, so I began an unending regime without soul or mercy, but buoyed up with a burning conviction that deliverance would come. It came finally in November, 1918, two years after her arrest. Weakened almost beyond recognition, she writes, out we streamed half crazed men and women into the arms of the British advance guard. In due course, her demobilization papers and her pay arrived from the British Intelligence Commission, along with the news that on the 8th of November, 1918, Sir Douglas Haig had mentioned her in dispatches. In 1919, the British Secretary of State for War, Winston Churchill, commended her gallant and distinguished service in the field. Then news came of the award of both the French and the Belgian Légion d'honneur, making her certainly the only woman, almost certainly the only combatant to have been decorated by four of the main combatant nations of the Great War. Yet, even her pride at her in her decorations and her joy that once again her beloved Belgium was a free nation, ambiguity remained. I shall always remember some of those nobler emissaries, men of all ranks, who came 
with the gray wave of the German army. With a second war looming, German interest in her was rekindled. Perhaps the 1933 film about her and her publication of spy novels reminded them of her actions. Now living in Manchester with her English husband, she was listed in the black book of prominent subjects who were to be arrested following the anticipated successful Nazi invasion of Britain. Mart died back in Belgium in 1966, a largely forgotten, four times decorated, reluctant agent who took the only course open to me, both as a nurse and as a spy. If Mart's spying activities were thrust upon her, our next spy, shop worker Gabrielle Petit, took the conscious decision to spy for the British. In July 1915, 22-year-old Gabrielle was invited to come to London for intelligence training. On her return to Brussels and adopting the cover of an ambulance saleswoman, she created her own cell and network and supplied the British with vital, meticulously compiled, invariably accurate information on trains, troop movements, and armaments. A network of informers was necessary. With aerial reconnaissance in its infancy, human eyes were the most efficient providers of information. Despite the complexity of the information demanded of her, Gabrielle's reports about troop movements were invariably accurate, and for a while she was adept at moving around undetected by the watchful Germans. The British rated her as amongst their most reliable agents behind enemy lines. Often frightened by the brutality meted out to Belgian civilians, particularly ones who, like her, were from the French-speaking lower classes, she nevertheless refused to, refused to be cowed by the dangers she faced. She claimed that, if I die in service, my death will be like a soldier's. However, the German occupiers were becoming increasingly suspicious of her, and her luck gave out on the 20th of January 1916. Betrayed by a Dutchman, Multiple interrogations followed her arrest and incarceration at St Giles Prison in Brussels. She seized every opportunity to stress her loathing of the Bosch occupiers of her homeland. Tant et violente la haine que j'ai pour votre race, such is my hatred of your race. Unsurprisingly, her words and attitude did little to endear her to her captors and sentence of death by firing squad was passed, a sentence which, according to her sister Hélène, she accepted with impressive sang-froid. Hélène's last conversation with her shows a woman who had been so outraged by the Germans' behaviour towards her compatriots that she would stop at nothing to work towards their defeat. On the 1st of April, having made her will, which I find pathetic in the paucity of her possessions. She left her best gloves to her godmother, as well as the embroidery she was sorry she had not finished. She left her precious small diamond ring to her sister Hélène and to her landlady, her savings account, with its few francs in, apologizing that it was not enough to pay her outstanding rent. The following morning, the 1st of April 1916, rejecting the steadying arm of a German soldier, she approached the stake. Refusing the proffered blindfold, she told her assembled executioners, Je n'ai pas besoin de votre aide. Vous allez voir comment une jeune fille belge sait mourir. I do not need your help. You will see that a young Belgian woman knows how to die. Seconds later, unable even to finish her proclamation, Vive le roi, vive la she lay dead. Rumour has it two of the firing squad refused to shoot and were instantly executed themselves. On the 27th of March 1919, her body was exhumed. 
At an elaborate funeral attended by Queen Elizabeth of the Belgians and Prime Minister Delacroix, the Queen posthumously awarded Gabriel Petit the Croix de l'Ordre de Léopold. Schoolchildren were subsequently issued with postcards quoting her last defiant words, encouraging them to emulate her patriotism. In 1923, a statue was unveiled, not without controversy, at Place Saint-Jean in Brussels. Although royalty, foreign diplomats and dignitaries were present, members of Gabrielle's working-class family were not included in the VIP list. They had to queue to be let in. But to the surprise of many, the statue is not the representation of a martyred victim, but of a defiant, ordinary woman who, fully aware of the risks she was taking, accepted that her life, when weighed against Belgium's cause, counted for little. A century later, Britain, slightly belatedly, acknowledged its debt to the young Belgian woman, and a memorial was unveiled to her at the National Arboretum. Her name, rightly, now liveth forevermore. Across the border in occupied France, another spy was also active, Louise de Bettigny. Dubbed the Joan of Arc of the North, she was born in Lille in 1880. Noted for her intelligence and her linguistic abilities, she spoke French, German, Czech, Italian and English, which by the way she perfected in my home county, Essex. She could also get by in Russian and Spanish. Having worked as a governess to a number of noble families, she was even invited to teach the children of one Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Sarajevo fame. But as he demanded she surrender her French nationality, she declined the invitation. Had she accepted, perhaps her fate may have been very different. When Lille fell to the German invaders in October 1914, Louise made her way to England. A British spy master offered her a salary to work for the British back in occupied France. She underwent intensive training in map reading and grid referencing. She learned to write in invisible ink on tissue paper, which could be swallowed if needs be, to engrave minute letters on spectacle frames and place these over the lenses and to conceal images in shoe heels, umbrellas, umbrella handles, as well as hems of skirts and also hollowed out vegetables. If anybody who is listening is in Kent or even in Folkestone, the spy school was at 8 Marine Parade Folkestone. It recently was restored and converted into flats. Once she had left spy school, she returned to Lille, where she set up a spy network of some 80 agents, which included a specialist in miniature writing who could write 1,600 words on a postage stamp. Much information was passed via neutral Holland, but doing so became increasingly hazardous when, in the spring of 1915, the Germans established an electrified fence across the Belgian-Dutch border. Crossing it proved almost as dangerous as crossing the Berlin Wall half a century later. It was known as the Wire of Death and <coughs> German guards regularly patrolled the, the area and victims could be lightning to death. We all learn from mistakes and spies, if the first mistake does not lead to detection, are no exception. In the early days, Louise had a couple of narrow escapes. On one occasion, she had concealed messages under the label of a matchbox. A German policeman, needing a match to light his pipe, confiscated the whole box. Perhaps unaware of her close shaves, in England, her spy master noted that her work was splendid. General Sir John French told her, we need more people like you. The German high command itself began to call the 40 kilometers around which her networks operated, the Cursed Front or Le Front Maudit. 
as out of nearly 700 miles of front lines, this is where they seem to suffer the greatest number of unexpected attacks and aerial bombardments. Life, and particularly life in war, is full of what ifs. One of the many what ifs of the Great War occurred on Louise's watch. One of her very last messages announced the Germans were preparing a massive attack on Verdun. The French commander who received the information simply refused to believe it. How could a mere woman know this? She must have got it wrong. The 162,308 French dead or missing of Verdun, not to mention the 100,000 German dead, may have wished he had been less of a doubting Thomas. With the Germans increasingly suspicious, in the autumn of 1915, the net began closing in around Lille. Louise knew that it was only a matter of time until her luck ran out. On the 20th of October 1915, she was arrested and thrown into St Giles Prison in Belgium. Even her captors were impressed by her courage. During six months of questioning and almost certainly torture, she never wavered. A fellow prisoner wrote, every means had been used in vain to make her speak. Eventually, enough incriminating evidence was gathered and in March 1916, her trial opened. Only the penalty was in question. Would the Germans dare to execute another woman, particularly one as high-born as Louise? Her father traced his ancestry back to Charlemagne. It is actually hard to know whether it was the Spanish authorities' intervention with a plea for clemency, the notoriety and backfiring of the Cavell execution, or her own social status, which led to the death sentence being commuted to lifetime imprisonment with hard labor. She was sent to the notorious Siegberg prison near Cologne in Germany. Conditions were amongst the harshest in all, in all of Germany. Freezing cells, putrid food, even the pig farmers refused the swill as their animal, animal, animals wouldn't eat it and infectious diseases such as typhus were rife. A British prisoner, Agnes Short from Preston, who spent nearly two years in Siegborg, has left a harrowing account of the conditions that she too endured. Louise led revolts against women being for forced to work in German munitions factories, which was of course against the terms of the Hague Convention. She was thrown into solitary confinement she was deprived of light, books, and even bedding. And eventually, in the freezing winter of 1917, Louise contracted pneumonia, which turned to pleurisy. When she developed an abscess on her lung, the Germans finally agreed to provide some minimal medical care. She was operated upon, not in hospital, but in the prison itself in a room previously used for typhus patients. She died on September the 27th, 1918, a mere 45 days before the victory which she had done her utmost to hasten during the nine months she operated as one of the Allies' most successful spies. She probably never knew that on the 20th of April 1918, sorry, 20th of April 1916, Maréchal Joffre had mentioned her in his dispatches. Louise was buried near the prison. Then, on the 21st of February 1920, her coffin was placed on a gun carriage, and with the French and British armies providing full military honours, her body was repatriated and buried near Lille. On the 13th of November 1927, a monument commemorating Louise de Bettigny and the heroic women of the occupied territories was unveiled. Maréchal Foch presided over the ceremony. Was he aware, I wonder, that if the French high command had been less misogynistic, the French army may not have been bled white at Verdun? 
posthumously awarded the OBE, the Military Medal, the Croix de Guerre avec Palme, and made a Chevalier of the Légion d'Honneur. Maréchal Joffre and General Sir John French had both recognized that her heroism and courage have rarely been surpassed. A co-prisoner at Siegberg commented, she served as an example of courage and sacrifice for us all. I wonder if you remember spy handler Elizabeth Schragmuller. Well, by 1917, her spy network had spread its tentacles across France. One of her most ruthless and efficient agents was working in Marseille. Please meet Regina Diana, real, her real name, Marie-Antoinette Avicou, the unruly daughter of French-Italian immigrants living in a working class area of Geneva. She was apparently a discreet prostitute, which seems a little bit of a contradiction in terms, but so be it. Her police record says she was discreet. She was also an operetta singer. In 1914, she had first earned her spurs spying in Paris, where she had proved adept at coaxing information out of both high-ranking officers and lowly NCOs relating to troop movements, the composition of various arsenals along the Franco-German border and the preferred routes for refueling military encampments. With Germany increasingly aware of Marseille's vital importance to Allied shipping, in 1915, Regina was moved south to Marseille, where her evening job as a musical artiste provided her with a perfect cover. Ordered to befriend officers and men whose position would have given them access to virtually every piece of intelligence the Germans would require, information about troops, equipment, ammunition, arms, cannon, and transportation, both railway and naval, she willingly obliged. As well as being France's premier port, Marseille was an important railhead linking the rest of France with this crucial gateway to France's empire. Railways, as well as high-ranking officers and gullible NCOs, would soon prove crucial to Regina's story. One of the very strange things that was going on in, in Marseille was although information that was being sent um, by letter was very, very heavily censored, people could buy postcards like this one of Russian troops arriving in Marseille, which seems very odd because you could actually buy pictures and then you couldn't um, any information that you were to write in a letter was censored. And we know that, Ma that Regina was busy sending these types of postcards back to her handlers. Not only did Fräulein Doctor pay spies well and quickly for accurate information, she also, and this is crucial to Regina's story, provided a generous expenses allowance. When Regina received her lover informants at Marseille's luxurious Grand Hotel des Princes in the Place de la Bourse area of Marseille, she must have thanked her lucky stars that she had escaped the dives and seedy rooms where many of her fellow music hall singers were forced by pimping managers to entertain their clients. By early 1917, Regina's network extended from Paris to Algiers, to Marseille, to Geneva, where her French-born French mother lived, and from there onwards to Zurich. Of course, you, couldn't send, you could send a letter to neutral or a postcard or information to neutral Switzerland. You naturally couldn't send information from France to any German-occupied territory or indeed to Germany. So her mother um, in Geneva was an absolute linchpin in this whole um, setup. Her informants ranged across the military and social spectra and gave her access to information covering troop movements as well as what was happening on the dock side. Amongst the intelligence she gleaned both from her own observations and pillow talk and supplied to Germany related to a forthcoming French offensive. She gathered that this was of vital importance. 
In order to transmit information, Regina was using various codes written in invisible ink. Its sale was naturally forbidden in Marseille, but she had been taught how to make her own. And she wrote this on postcards sent to multiple addresses in Zurich and then, of course, onwards to Berlin. One series of cards revealed intelligence about huge numbers of troops massing in Marseille, awaiting to be sent to a ridge in northern France, where the authorities were planning what would turn into an engagement with calamitous consequences for the, for the French, the Chemin des Dames. Most spies would agree that however many precautions they take, however brilliant their training and indeed their own skills, Lady Luck has a part to play. And Lady Luck was now about to make her appearance in Regina's life in the form of a wood-burning stove. One of Regina's postcards was covering the 470 kilometers from Marseille to Switzerland on the night, night mail train. The post wagon was heated by a large wood burning stove. Vigilant postal workers were sorting the post ready for the train's arrival in Lyon. Letters and postcards were scattered across the main sorting table close to the stove. The temperature was near tropical. So much so that something strange began to happen to one card. Phoenix like, a second message began to appear. This seemingly innocent looking postcard was not what it seemed to be. Making an emergency stop in Lyon, the card was handed to the local gendarme who rushed it to the military authorities in Paris. They passed it on to a specialist in disguised handwriting. To the authorities' horror, the card was relaying intelligence about the significant civilian unrest in Marseille, as well as crippling strikes, information that was being heavily censored. The enemy must not hear about it. Now the spy was being spied upon. In a one week period, four postcards destined for Zurich were traced back to the same postcard near the Grand Place de la Bourse in Marseille. These reported not only on the all important civilian morale, but gave precise insider information that leave for French poilu was being canceled an indication that a big push was imminent and that over 4,000 British and Canadian troops were mustering, ready to depart for northeastern France. Aware of the importance of her intelligence, Regina sent it multiple times while some of her postcards were intercepted. We know that others got through. She was arrested on the 16th of March, 1917, mountains of evidence against her were painstakingly amassed and preserved in the French ar ar archives, which are available to be examined today. 470 predominantly damning items, including the names of troop ships that had been sunk with considerable loss of life, were presented to the military court. So sensitive was the information that the court sat in camera. On the 20th of September, 1917, to the surprise of no one, the president of the court announced, pronounced both the guilty verdict and the sentence. In accordance with Article 81 of the Military Code, civilian Marie-Antoinette Avico, alias Regina Diana, was to be executed by firing squad. But the process of law was not yet complete. Justice still had both to be done and to be seen to be done, and the court findings had to be confirmed by higher authority. The judgment was dispatched to the military court in Lyon. The findings and sentence were duly approved here on 22nd of October 1917, days after the successful Matahari execution. Now, it was for the Court of Appeal in Paris to reach a final decision. Should clemency be extended, or was the case solid, and thus the relevant article of the military code could be enforced? The court's verdict was dated the 22nd of November, 1917. The prosecution had proved its case and no appeal for clemency was permitted. Raymond Poincaré, president of the French Republic had decided justice should take its course and the dread sentence be carried out. 
as the firing party mustered on Saturday, the 5th of January, 1918 at 6.30 a.m. Uh, Marseille's Champ de Tierfajo, the crowds also gathered. If the trial had been held behind closed doors, not so the execution. The expectant spectators might have wondered why the firing party consisted not of the usual 12 men, but of 25, each with a loaded rifle. The French authorities were determined that nothing would prevent 32-year-old Regina Diana paying the ultimate price for her crime. Of the 25 shots fired, 12 impacted on the body, three on the heart. A nameless, unidentifiable common burial pit awaited the mortal remains of this highly colourful, loud and deeply enigmatic woman. Researching her story over several years, I still cannot decide if she was a helpless pawn caught up in a game that was too intricate and too complicated, whose rules she did not fully comprehend, or whether she, like her spy mistress Elisabeth Schragmüller, was glorying in her power. But unlike the highly educated Schragmüller born to wealth and privilege, Regina had had to claw her way up from her lowly background. Like all agents, she knew the stakes were high but spying seemed to give her the opportunity to move away from being a cafe concert and music hall artiste at the beck and call of pimping managers and allow her to live a life which would have been beyond her wildest dreams before those shots were fired at Sarajevo on the 28th of June, 1914. In October 2019, Regina was returned to her rightful place on the stage and can now be viewed on YouTube. If you would like to see this rich and fascinating story brought to life, the information is up on this slide or feel free to email me and I can send you the link. Mart, Gabrielle, Louise and Regina are far from the only spies of the Great War, although Elizabeth is the only known spy mistress. And of course, it was not only spies who contributed to the war effort. Should I have whetted your appetite to find out more about Regina or some of the hundreds of forgotten women, including the women poets of the First World War? There are many stories and talks on my website, firstworldwarwomen.co.uk, and the inevitable plug, my books are available via either via my publisher, Pen and Sword, or of course, on amazon.co.uk. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Viv. Um, okay, Viv, there's been obviously much interest in, in, in the topic and interest in your presentation. I'll go through them in the order that they arrive with me. Firstly, from Malcolm Cole. Is Martha Knockhart, sorry, in Martha uh, Knockhart's book, I Was a Spy, she refers to the safety pin men Spies identified by two safety pins placed diagonally under their lapel. Have you heard of this anywhere else or was it just a Belgian thing? I haven't heard of it anywhere else. So obviously, I, I have no way of knowing whether it was just a, a Belgian Belgian thing, but she certainly she makes quite a she mentions it on more than one occasion. I think there were possibly ways that spies could identify themselves or know who was in the network, but I'm sorry, I don't know more than that. Okay, thank you for that. John Richardson, how did the British get agents back into Lille from Folkestone? Oh gosh, it was it was convoluted. They had to go via Holland. They went via via yeah. Holland and then then they worked their worked their way back into into France via via Belgium, but it was it was pretty perilous. And Louise obviously then had to go both ways and she she traveled to to folks into england several several times i can't remember off the top of my head how many times but she does mention how perilous a journey it it was to actually sort of cross um enemy territory and then get into holland neutral holland um that was the way that it was it was done it was via neutral holland and the the electric fence made that more difficult i guess did it 
Yes, yes. I mean, it was it was easier until that put in an appearance, and the Germans, I think, were very aware of what was going on, and so that's why they they brought this in. And I don't know if anybody remembers the hollowed vegetables talking of the electric fence. One of the reasons that they were taught to hollow out vegetables was that they would um, sort of at night, they would hurl um, hollowed out turnips or whatever across the, the, friend, the, the fence into, into Holland where these could be picked up and the message um, removed from the, from the turnip. So one now looks at a turnip in a slightly different light, I feel. Not that I've ever tried to hollow one out to put a message in it, but that was that was one of the ways that it was it was done. Richard Owens, how were those women who worked with the Germans received by their compatriots at the war's end? I should imagine very badly. Yeah. I should imagine that it was um there's there's little actually been written about about them to the best of best of my knowledge. But if we think of what happened in the in the second world after the second war, the the collaboratrice, yeah. there was very much the same attitude, and there was very much there was even that attitude um, towards, for example, um, families who'd had a German billeted upon them in occupied France or Belgium and become friendly with them. There was a huge reprisal against. A against them first time round, whether they were sort of tarred and feathered um, in the same way as in the second war, I don't know, but certainly they were very, very badly received. And um, children, as, as you mentioned, I've got an interest in, in children in and just after the Great War, children actually mention how their, how their mothers were, were treated. And very often these women had, they had a German billeted upon them and they had little, they had no choice in it. And often they were, by being friendly to the German, they would get a little bit of extra food, which was then given to the children. So it was, it was very, very vicious after the war. And another complication was the way that the um, those in unoccupied France actually referred to the French who had been occupied as les Boches du Nord, and condemned them for having been forced to have Germans in their homes. So it was a it was a pretty bitter period that. Sure often sort yeah. of slightly overlooked. I'm sure. David Bowman, do we know what they were paid for doing their work? Was it really well paid or what, or, and was the pay an incentive? Certainly, um, Schragmuller believed very strongly in paying spies well. For um, Regina made a significant amount of money in relative terms, re relative to what she, she had been used to. To earning, so I think that the pay for some some in women was significant. They needed the money. Um, I'm not sure how generous the Brits were; rather less so, I think, than the than the Germans from my reading reading of it. But the the Germans, um, Schragmuller, it was if, if the intelligence was good, then you you went up a, a ranking and you got a you got higher pay, and um, and a generous expense allowance, which certainly enabled Regina to move from the area that I showed in the second postcard to um, the Grand Hotel des Princes, which is a very luxurious looking hotel in, in Marseille. So I think that the, the pay did come into it. And um, for those, um, it, it's so easy to condemn spies who spied for the other side and to heroinize those who, who spied for us. Um, and I think that for all of them, there was some money incentive. Some it was like pretty. It was very much patriotism. Bettini, it was very much patriotism. But others, there was a there was a financial incentive. Were any German women spies active in the UK? Is, is there anything documented on that? I or have not Hugh discovered Thompson. one. Um, I suppose in a way, it may be, maybe they were, and they were just very successful. I mean, we know the sort of obviously the stories, and there were women who were supposedly spies married to. To German um, German women married to to English men and that type of thing, and there are all these apocryphal stories going round. But I've never discovered any um, anything any particular evidence. Maybe somebody has, and I haven't come across it yet. Um, okay, a question: Is this talk going to be come out as a book? It is a book. Um, it is several books. There's the, the book about Regina. Um, I can just grab it, just a sec. Um, a question dunk. from Peter Little. Let me just show. There's Regina's story. 
Has that worked? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah. yep. So she's she she's got a book to herself, which is is the sort of background of um, sort of bit of history of spies and all from way back, female spies, obviously, and the intriguing uh, little known story of his of Switzerland in the First World War. Um, people tend to think Switzerland in the First World War has nothing of interest in it. Um, I would beg to differ, having researched it, having lived in Switzerland and then researched it for this book. So yes, she she's got a book of her of her own, um, and um, Gabrielle and Louise are in my first one, the Forgotten Women of the First World War. We also served. Okay, thank you. Uh, a number of female spies in each commandant. Is the number known? Do we have any idea as to the scope of it? Um, the French executed, to my knowledge, the French actually executed something like nine women. There were several Swiss women also spying for Germany in France. And because they were Swiss nationals, the Swiss managed to get them off. Regina, if she if the war had broken out about six months later, she would have been a Swiss national, and her story might have been very different. Um, but she was she was a French she was an Italian national through her father, and therefore when when she was arrested, um, the Swiss did nothing at all to help her. They washed washed their hands of her completely. Um, but the French there there were a number of of other women um, working for for Germany in France, and of course vice versa. That was a question from Ian Ferrance. Uh, 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 Peter Curran, can, can you let us know what became of Elizabeth Kressmuller? Yes, um, she she slightly dis well, she did disappear after the war. She went back to um, Fribourg in Brisgau and she got a position at um, the university there. And um, she was working under a professor who basically published papers that she had written in her name. Uh, he, he published them in his name, even though she had, um, she was sort of basically the one who'd done um, most of the research. In um, 19, her brother became involved with the, with the Nazis and it's believed that the Nazis were trying to recruit her to work for them. And she actually died, um, I think it was of TB um, or consumption. She died in 1942. Her papers, um, she had stayed in touch with um, Walter Nikolai and he um, worked for the Nazis and he was arrested and sent to Russia in 1945. And his, the papers, including all the information about Schragmuller, actually ended up in, in Moscow where it was buried until about 1997. And was then, it, um, it came to light, the information about her and about um, Nikolai was actually um, released from the um, Russian archives in 19, I think it was 1997, but round about then. Okay. Paul Cobb, have you encountered French Belgian agents from the Great War who did get tracked down by the enemy in World War II, having stayed in France or Belgium? A any? No, I throw that open to anybody else. Anybody got any on answers on that one? Well, they can feed them in if they have. Um, was it Mark Smith, was Edith Cavill trained as a spy? Uh, or if not, how did she gain knowledge to uh, to allow troops to escape? She, it was a, a escape route, wasn't it? Through there the was, north? yes, that's it. There was a there was a network that she she was involved with, and um, they were they were sort of moved down the or up along the line. I don't know if it was a down or an up, but should we say they were moved along the along the line, and she she was participating in that. It was it was quite a strong germ. Um, um, Belgian network that she was involved with. I don't know if we've got anybody listening from Canada, um, but just briefly, if so, they may know that there is actually a mountain called after her and a lake in, yes. um, in Alberta. Near Jasper. That's quite, yes, that's it. It's it, it, Jasper, isn't it? That is, yes, that's right. Up in the north. Um, okay, there's a. Uh, don't, if people can hold far on questions out, well, I think we've got enough here. Was there any retribution in Belgium in World War II towards anyone who who had acted against the Germans 
in World War One. My gut feel would be yes. In fact, yes, I I do know of one one woman who there was retribution against her. Um, she very conveniently died just literally just before the, the Nazis came knocking on her door. An older an older woman, um, and so yes, definitely one case that I know of, and almost certain if you think how Mart was on the Nazi black book, even though she was in um, in England, almost certainly. And there is one woman that I that I know of who they they came um, to arrest second time round. And I'm sure luckily for her, she was an older woman. She she popped her clogs. Uh, Michael Phipps, was it was there a formal structure for intelligence gathering in Germany? Like, like MI5, for example. Yes, I don't know much about it, but I remember reading that there, there certainly, certainly was. And to my recollection, again, um, the, the the spy book was written about three years ago, and there've been several since. Um, but to my to my recollection, it was as structured as you would expect anything German to be. Okay, let, let me ask you this one. Then this this could take us until uh, next Monday. From Andrew Boyd. What is the role of a loyal citizen in an occupied country? Discuss. Huh? Oh, that's a tricky one, How isn't it? How long have we got? <laughs> yes. <laughs> a loyal citizen. You, the, the, the writings that I've read about those in, and they are particularly from children in, in occupied France, most of them saw their loyal duty, and I am talking about children, but I'm sure that they um, picked this up from, from parents and school, school teachers, etc. Most of them saw their, their duty to do everything they could to resist the occupier. And there are some ch fascinating children's diaries about living in, um, in occupied France. And they certainly felt that their their duty was to resist the occupier in every way they could. And what's fascinating is, is a child who at 40, um, in 1914 was age 12, he sees it one way and as he matures, his resistance becomes um, less childish, like spitting at the German soldiers to be much more sort of um, cognizant of what he's doing and how he should resist. So I suppose the answer is yes to that one. Will that do, or do I have to write a whole essay? You do, you do. <laughs> but Michael Jackson asks, Viv, at the end when we finished and we, we part company, can you put your slide with the website details back up there? Can you do yes, that? Yes, of course. I'll keep the meeting yes. open so anybody that didn't get a chance to take the details can do that. Um, Jack Wadbrook, do you have any idea how much the wartime espionage organisations continued over into the post-war period? Was there an overlap into the you know, the, the unsettled Europe? Not that I've heard of, no. Um, but that's not to say that it it wasn't. But the people that I've researched and the ones that I've I've read about, both ones I've talked about and ones that that I haven't haven't talked about, it seemed to sort of fizzle out pretty pretty quickly. I think they were probably quite glad to go home. Okay, right. The the, the final question uh, and we'll come back to the website at the end, Michael. Uh, this is from Ian in uh, Brooklyn. What role has sexism within the discipline of studying the Great War played in, for example, the fact that 10 year olds can rattle off facts about Manfred von Richthofen, but these female spies, who arguably might have had more of an impact than taking down 81 planes, are largely forgotten or not emphasised? Um, my initial answer to that is that for decades, sort of history of the Great War was written primarily, I think, by by men, and that those who were involved in what was directly seen as wartime activities, i.e. taking down 81 planes, was seen as being a sort of part of the man's war. And women were seen very much on the to be on the home front and a bit of nursing and munitions work. And nobody really thought to look beyond that at what else they might have been been doing. And I think that it's only really with a sort of um, a newer generation of, of female historians who've been fairly determined to find women's contributions that we're starting now to redress the balance. 
Yeah. Viv, thank you. And uh, we'll, uh, Michael, we'll put the uh, the website details back up shortly. But Viv, thank you. Uh, a fascinating, intriguing evening, really. Um, I, I, I'm always really amazed and very impressed when I see the, the in-depth, the fantastic research that people do into subjects that obviously excite them very much. And uh, I, 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 well, I, I, I wouldn't for a minute say that, but I thought uh, I, I thought from start to finish, it was uh, areas that I knew, I, I knew a little about some of them, but very, but it was very telling. The, the images that you, you showed us again, so, uh, where they came from, but quite fantastic. Those postcards that, that, that were, that, that the train revealed was uh, just something uh, that was- Absolutely fascinating. I mean, I've got the, because they're actually on the French Memorial des Hommes, um, website and I've sort of downloaded them all and they are absolutely intriguing and, and the way you see the sort of the the invisible writing that that started to appear and I just love the fact and that the French had specialists in disguised handwriting that you know they could nip nip the cards across to him I mean amazing and what's fabulous what really amuses me is he he's written out all all the reports and everything about that about the what is disguised and everything and he's written it in such illegible handwriting himself <laughs> that somebody had to transcribe it all and every time I look at it I just I just giggle because it amuses me here's this expert in handwriting and you can't read his handwriting <laughs> but Barbara Taylor comments that she's re she reviewed uh, the book uh, I think the one on Regina uh, for Stan too so it, if you look on the website folks if you want to find out more Barbara's review is there and and just a comment before we we say good night to uh, William Rosenfeld as a Canadian the first mountain he climbed in 1952 was the was Edith Cavell really uh, that I read her history which led to life so there you go so th thanks oh, that's, uh, that's a fascinating little share isn't it <laughs> it, it is indeed so Viv uh, thank you for a, a, an inspiring evening with with lots to take away lots to, to think about and uh, and I'm sure lots more research for us to go and do and uh, and maybe the best place to start will be with some of the books that you've written. Thank you very, so, very much. And just if anybody is interested in the little um, performance that was put on in Basel and Switzerland of Regina, the, the information about the link is also on the on the slide. And if you're trying to fill in an hour of lockdown, it might entertain you. And we, we the tradition at the end of these uh, webinars is that we, we show our applause by waving a big hand. So uh, those of you who... <laughs> can find that button on, on the bottom menu bar, please uh, just show your appreciation. But Viv, from all of us, it's been a, a, a terrific evening and, and thank you for your time. Thank, and thank you for your, thank uh, your, 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 your presentation. Thank you for asking me and I'll pop the slide back up, shall I? Thank you. And before we go, just to remind next Monday, 30th of November, uh, a month in the life of the chief, Douglas Haig in September, 1917, Paul Harris will look at the defining months of the third battle of Ypres through the eyes and the uh, the thoughts of Douglas Haig that's Monday the 30th um, and, and if you're still with us uh, you'll have received Stan 2 uh, uh, the special edition of Stan 2 uh, written in memory of the uh, burial of the unknown warrior uh, the body brought back from the western front in 1920 Ralph McTell, working with Billy Connolly, uh, Anthony Hopkins and Liam Neeson, has produced a terrific uh, five minute video that's on YouTube uh, as a tribute to the Unknown Warrior. The horn section, which is which is very beautiful, I have to say, was put together by a friend of my wife and I, a student that my wife taught. Um, and, and it's well worth, if you can, and you've got time, just going onto YouTube, Ralph McTell, The Unknown Warrior, and you'll get five minutes of an intriguing, some great footage of the, of the day itself, and some really wonderful music that supports uh, the narrative. Uh, and Ralph McTell's request is that if you do that, make a donation to the British Legion, as with many other charities, of course, their income has been hard hit this year, and with Poppy Day being cancelled effectively, uh, he just asks that you do that. So, so just if you've got time, um, Ralph McTell, the the unknown soldier. Yeah, thanks. Viv. There's Thank a lot you. of people, a lot of people waving at you saying they enjoyed it. Right, wave my hand back. Thank you. Okay, bye. Take bye. care. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you again. Thank you.
Yeah.